Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to the second day of E India Health Summit 2013. With a successful first day, we are coming up with a new day of uh, various sessions. The first session of the day will be on IT in health, the way ahead. IT in health, India is having a great history on, in both these uh, things. IT, we have a future of Mahabharata. Health, we have a, few, uh, we have a past of uh, Ayurveda. India is coming up with various initiatives in IT as yesterday uh, Ministry of Health, people from Ministry of Health also uh, informed about various initiatives from their side, whether it is uh, telemedicine or whether it is uh, various e-governance initiatives from Health Ministry. Various private sectors, uh, companies also coming up with various new IT innovations. Development, developmental uh, organizations are also using IT uh, in uh, uh, health welfare. So it's a vast subject. And to discuss this subject, today we are having uh, a panel of esteemed speakers. Uh, I invite the speakers on the dais. I'll start with uh, Sri Srinivasan Ramakrishnan, former DG CDAC. Uh, sir, please join us on the stage. A big hand for sir. Then I invite Sri Munindar Suparna, CIO, uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs. Sir, please join us on the dais. Sri Girish Kulkarni, Practice Head, Healthcare, Magic Tech Solutions, Private Limited. Sir, can you please join us on the stage? A big hand for sir. Shri B.K. Murli, Managing Director, Hope Hospital. I welcome you on the stage, sir. A big hand. Uh, Dr. Jajit Bhattacharya, Director, Government Advisory, HP South Asia. Sir, okay, sir is there. Uh, I welcome you on the stage, sir. A big hand for Dr. Bhatt uh, I hope this session will uh, come up with enriching uh, uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, for the, with this, I hand over the mic and the stage uh, to uh, Sri Srinivasan Ramakrishnan to chair the session. Sir, please. Um, morning. Um, welcome to. I think this required uh, committed people to come on a morning session. Uh, honestly, I don't know about uh, how the uh, last uh, afternoon sessions. Unfortunately, I had to miss that. But we'll add uh, gusto to the morning session. At least five of us are very committed and fresh in the morning. Um, we have, since we have started 20 minutes, I will uh, request each of the panelists to take 10 minutes and uh, maybe two or uh, two, three minutes for Q&A. And at the end, uh, we'll have another 15 minutes common audience participation. So that will give us an opportunity to close it as per the original schedule of uh, 11 o'clock. Um, basically, as you know that uh, E health is, uh, despite all the seriousness and commitment, is more of, uh, I would say, comparatively a laggard in the IT vertical. You know, if uh, you were to say that banking, finance, and uh, insurance is a leader, health, that's true of all over the world because it's a basically a somewhat of the conservative even though you may say social sectors themselves are somewhat like that. But um, need is very compelling. You know, if you look at the numbers of the health sector, both from the point of view of um, size of the sector, uh, both from the GDP point of view,
yesterday they might have also discussed uh, um, what has been holding it back and uh, what can we do to turn the fortunes. One thing for sure, you know, if US it took them 20 years, I remember Mrs. Bill Clinton when uh, Mr. Clinton was the president, she took up an opportunity, I'll do something on health. And look at it took uh, almost uh, four presidential terms before Obama took on that game to change it. At least uh, something to be passed. Uh, equally, um, it took a landslide issue to publicly announce how the big time uh, effort in UK didn't turn out to be that easy either. So I said whether it is a small or big, it has been a challenging area because it's inherently linked to the fortunes of how the sector is organized, public and private, in many other ways. And uh, therefore, um, it's a very, um, uh, but as I said, um, um, the fortunes, uh, that's why I think I must congratulate the organizers for this morning session to title it as the way ahead, IT in health, way ahead. Um, I think while we all, all five of us will try to be a little more pragmatic and all of you as either are equally so, but I'm sure uh, we are very opportunistic, very optimistic about and uh, we are just after all in 2013, uh, we are familiar with the jargon of 2020. So we have got a fairly good amount of number of years to turn the fortunes of IT in health in India into a very serious uh, game changer, if you will, uh, at least if nothing else, in a big time foundation laying so that we can see uh, uh, dramatic changes in the years further behind. Because it's not a one day wonder either. So with that uh, few uh, words, uh, let me invite, uh, I guess I'll take the, the beginning or the end, whichever way. Um, Mr. Johnson, is he there? None of us here? is not there. Okay. I'll say uh, part of that sequence, uh, say uh, be briefly my presentation and then. Um, there is likely to be some, quite a bit of repetition in many points, particularly in the absence of uh, um, you know, partly this is to convey the point that uh, quite often I heard even very recently in, in an uh, occasion saying that uh, health is very complex and uh, it's not an easy thing, all the more so in IT in health. So if you see here, partly before we make the, the cl clarify the riddle of how easy or difficult or complex, we find we keep hearing quite often first and foremost urban and rural. Then we hear about social sectors, health education and others. Then we said we have got a demographic dividend, young, the gender on one side and then we are a very old uh, you know senior age group and things of that kind and then if you come to the economic and um, you know if you don't have the uh, money to pay for it you have a problem again so whichever way the dynamics of um, the socio-economic dynamics particularly in the social sector and even so in the health sector is a very daunting complexity I just want to say that lest uh, we oversimplify as if we can change it overnight. Again, this particular conference where you have a big time, uh, whole completely parallel track on e-health, I just put down a few examples of where uh, it, it has an impact, ICT or say telemedicine and uh, clinical decision support or point of care, which has already been, there have been sessions on that Similarly, in the rural areas, you find the SMS reminders of, you will find more of that in the subsequent talk, drug compliance, online health information, things of that kind, but 
in a larger scale yet to happen none of us get those kind of a issue unless till all of us from day to day see that it is not but that is a very great opportunity and invariably there is always a elaborate discussion on electronic health record patient record when will i see the day and in there is also a great discussion about how easy or how difficult people want it today but people say that it's not that easy either so should you do how should we go about it how long will it take particularly as you know health is a state subject in india if one state does it and another state does it how easy is going to be the interoperability related issues so ehr and emr is a straight a topic which is very important everybody agrees how will you go about realizing that everybody views as an important issue it's a central issue and of course this is an uh, intervention surveillance is uh, pretty good success has happened in the past in the last 5 5 years ever since the idsp and many other systems have been put in place thanks to who and other um, important uh, topic inventory management for supplies very recently there is a big uh, um, editorials on the tb um, um, drugs short supply and there are many more such cases so i have i know that different people will talk about different i have underlined a few important topic which i thought i'll just flag them here one is the importance of data 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 and data to the extent i have seen i have visited in the last 6 uh, to 8 weeks all the way in some seven states all the way up to villages talking to asha worker and end worker data is a big problem i think they all maintain uh, some 34 records each of them at least 15 to 35 records and there is a endless errors so and then of course i mentioned about health records then uh, there is a issue about infrastructure manpower and third issue is about architecture standards and interoperability you know there are this is particularly true in the you know sector like this where it's a highly silos based if you go to uh, everybody is looking at his side of the problem and you don't know whenever this particular issues will get sorted out but if you don't get sorted and start the game now we'll have a bigger problem tomorrow so this is that's why i feel this is a very important topic more recently the ehr emr standards has been put out on the net for public comments public comments have come the deadline is over now so i think uh, that consent committee of ministry of health very good people are working on that so that should be out and they should be this year you will see some adoption on that because adoption is one thing and second to uh, get it implementation is more different thing i already mentioned about then of course uh, strategies at scale and roll out big scale so big mistakes or if you do systematically from bottom up or top down whichever way you do possible and then we have to have so many stakeholders unless they synchronize it won't work and uh, the technology it gives a great opportunity we we are some of us were discussing about products and solutions and then of course innovation this is a very clearly india has a opportunity there any late comer has an opportunity provided he does a smart job so this is one one unreadable slide but if you are closely look at it whole cycle of information data partly from how you can design forms combine forms for data for 10 different uh, uh, situations e forms <coughs> put it in a mobile all convert your data collection into near real time or even real time the 10 lakh uh, asha workers and end worker data can be collected that can be the way for way forward for your um, decision support system dashboard everything is possible this is a very much if you put streamline it what is not there but is very much possible from all the way from a doctor to health worker 
uh, to health administrator to uh, you know uh, public health government think of everybody this can be one binding if only finally one way you can see that i mentioned many of these issues there are uh, worldwide experience you need to look at what not to do and we have to innovate how to do it within india on one side there is no easy way out but the journey you cannot postpone it so uh, we have been working on this i'll tell in a minute i'll share it with you how uh, that exercise is being seriously be he's be starting out and um, in a way this talks about the complete ecosystem from all points of view of course the center is a the patient then you have the, you see the hospital then you see the health worker then you see the field then you find the insurance when you pharmacy you can think of on the telemedicine telepathology you can look at even uh, uh, training you can look at all possibilities if you can see the they all have to be interconnected they are by very nature in health is one field i feel more than any other field is absolutely the the, the each step you interconnect you find that much exponential gain you make see one of the starting point is nowhere near we are there in uh, many discussion other than in a typical hospital when somebody is investing most of the forum we are not yet fully gained on winning the confidence what gain does it give to me surprisingly it's very surprising because it in so many verticals is taken for granted what are the benefits whereas in health we still have not fully uh, fully satisfied particularly people who take the decisions so i guess all this efficiency equity and quality decisions are we are seeing it we are demonstrating it but still unless the value of integration if you see in the top effective health care delivery then you find from the prevention to monitoring diagnosis delivery of health entire value of the chain when you do the integration then you find all gains are fantastic it will be demonstrable gains numbers can be put on the table so what has been the focus area more recently we have uh, finalized uh, initial stages to see key topics of public health patient care and governance covering all the stakeholders that has been for all well, the key areas of service delivery resulting in imr level improved quality of care improved internal efficiency within the whether it is in the hospital administrators or within the government internal administrations so in a sense this has been narrowed down as some of the key focus areas where we should see a measurable gains if you want to spend money that's what the government is looking at very seriously on this issue <clears throat> but the key point over here is the policy advocacy it is not there as i said in uh, 12th plan discussion it has not been there only now in the last 6 months 9 months it is beginning to be a uh, i mean meeting is taking place at the pmo level and the uh, ministry of health and the department of it to look at all aspects of all the way when will we see even private sector fully the regulation basis will be able to adopt it so those kind of an issues are happening the policy of it adoption or e health in a true sense of the term discussion level it is now beginning to happen so in a sense of the term policy to program to action to success is a reasonably lengthy but it has to start with a policy sure you will find something in the hospital being something is being adopted we have seen almost 15 years in the telemedicine where has it gone sometimes uh, the bottom up in a very slow thing just doesn't go it's in the india the size and scale unless the policy is done quickly followed by one step after another after another you won't be able to carry conviction so 
in a sustainable roadmap for the now that we are talking about road ahead milestones culture and confidence processes and systems unless each one of them in the sector takes strong roots i don't think a sustainable roadmap will happen easily so the keeping this in mind the last 6 uh, to 8 months health mission mode project was approved by government uh, homework has been done report has been finalized and go to the next step of detailed project proposal exercise is going to begin scheduled to begin shortly this is coming as part of a national e governance project as a part of uh, you know originally what started as a 27 mission mode project and more recently four got added health education public distribution system and post so health is very much there at last so a broad topic like a vision like integrated service delivery model for e health that serves all stakeholders and enables better health outcome the emphasis is on integration better things on uh, um all stakeholders and better better health outcome so this each one of them distinguished in the current scenario unlike integrated you go to each one is they are all separate as silos separate separate all stakeholders stakeholders are not talking to each other currently and in better health outcome you are not able to specify people are not fully clear about what is this better outcome means so called key performance indicators or kpis so if all these are all falling in place then we will be able to make a big difference in the coming years for the benefit of all thank you or we can move on to the next one and the reserve the questions in the end Mr. Is not there. Yes, sir. Doctor, the uh, Yajit Bhattacharya. Bhattacharya. I don't have this. Nobody has given me all the bio, bio data. But Yajit Bhattacharya, as the author of uh, a book and a legendary figure, uh, I would use the word uh, Ernst and Young, entrepreneur, those kind of a thing. I guess you are too well known, at least uh, to the uh, many forum. I guess if some of the, some in, the, in this forum doesn't do not know. Yajit is a IIT Delhi alumni also, and uh, he is also currently uh, he did his PhD there, and uh, does part-time faculty also there, and uh, in e-governance he has a book to his credit, and uh, I guess uh, he is doing um, uh, valuable work currently in HP. but um, i don't know the full story if you want you can add a few more points thank you dr ramke it's uh, for your very very kind words um, as you rightly said uh, my alumni is actually it kanpur and i did my phd from it delhi and in okay. between i did my mba from i am calcutta and have been involved in a few things so thank you so much uh, i'll quickly walk you through a small video of what we have done uh, that will probably take 5 minutes and i'll walk you through the background of it in another 5 minutes that should take care of the 10 minutes i hope there's an audio over here is an audio baba ne sikhaya ki apni har koshish par vishwas karna sikho aur ek din hamare sare sapne sach ho jayenge दिन रात मेहनत करने लगे खेतों को समय पर तैयार जो करना था मगर एक दिन धीरे धीरे बीमारी और बढ़ने लगी गांव के लोगों ने कहा अब और उम्मीद नहीं
उस शहर में डॉक्टर हैं दवाइयां हैं पर हमारे पास वहां जाने के लिए पैसे ही नहीं थे मगर उस दिन कुछ ऐसा हुआ जो हमारे जीवन को हमेशा के लिए बदल देने वाला था बाबा सच ही कहते थे जिसके पास उम्मीद है उसके लिए कुछ भी नामुमकिन नहीं अब किसने सोचा था कि एक पूरा का पूरा स्वास्थ्य केंद्र ही कोई गाड़ी से उठाकर ला सकता है केंद्र में हमें यह भी सिखाया गया कि किस तरह हम बीमारियों से So, so a quick background of um, what the solution was that we had rolled out uh, initially in Chasala, then in Lakhimpur, Kedi, in UP, and then in the outskirts of uh, Hyderabad itself in Ailabad. Um, let's go back into, the, into why we picked up the solution, why we created the solution for India. Uh, if you look at the health scenario in India, I don't think we need to repeat what's the situation. It's uh, much worse than even sub-Saharan Africa in, in terms of at least MMR and IMR. I'll not go into the details of these because all of us are aware of it and we don't have time. So what's the issue basically, especially from a rural perspective, even from an urban perspective, that there is an issue in terms of access to healthcare. Villages with no primary health center 
regions with no hospitals, even if there are hospitals, there are no equipment. When we went down to many of these uh, primary health centers, we found that very fancy equipment, such as X-ray machines and so on, are put behind iron collapsible gates with the lock being rusted, the gates being rusted, nobody has a key. We went to another village in, uh, in Rajasthan called Sora and we went down and we asked the, the caretaker, uh, the security person, as to where is the doctor. He says, uh, doctor doesn't come for the last two, three months, so who's taking care of these patients who are roaming around here? He says, I'm there, why don't you worry? I'm there to take care of them, I, I give the medicines. Which basically what he does probably is give wide spectrum antibiotics, it works, it'll work for some time and basically create a very devastating effect in the long term on the population. Um, and so whether equipments, there are no doctors, if there are doctors, there's no support, there's no electricity, forget about computers, that's far too much to talk about, and there are no connectivity. So um, essentially, if you look at how government rolls out healthcare infrastructure, um, the government will decide to set up a sub-center or a PHC or a district health center, which means that um, a budget will be allocated, which will take about a year, because the B will come out, the RE will come out, and then the budget gets allocated. Then the tendering will happen, either PWD or CPWD or somebody will come and then build it up. And hopefully in three to four years' time, you'll get something out there. And in, in, in quite a few cases, there'll be nothing but cows grazing on the land and nothing will come up. Given that situation that we are all aware of because of the, of the procedural complexities in the government, the point was that how do we make sure that the moment we have the budgets in place, we can instantaneously roll out something which is tangible, where there is monitoring happening. We know that the refrigerator, if it's down for more than four hours, the vaccines cannot be used and an alert goes out to everybody else. How do we know that the doctor is coming and not coming? How do we know which patient is coming in? How do we know the patient disease profile in that area? For example, in Chosala, we figured out that most of the people have got skin rashes and COPD, which is a respiratory disease. Now, typically, people will not go around talking about skin disease because that's taboo. You don't go around and say, I've got skin disease. But once they start coming to this center, because of the EMR behind it, we could create, we could have the data analytics which showed that the profile is that 32% of the population has got skin disease, another 26% has got uh, breathing problems, COPD. And it turned out that, and we, then we told the local MP that there's a problem, he went and checked the, the fertilizers, pesticides, everything. And it turned out that the water, which is a local pond where the buffaloes also go and they also, and the people also go, is a source of the skin disease. Then we asked them, why are the women having COPD? Because they don't smoke and it's a very clean environment in the rural area, so why are they having skin, the, the respiratory diseases? Again, after a lot of research, it turned out that uh, it's because of the, of the cook stove that they use in the closed kitchens that they have, the chulas basically. So basically, we are also getting into preventive healthcare because of these kind of solutions coming in. So we saw that all of this happening, so what is the solution that we can have? And you saw the solution was taking a shipping container which is standardized, you, nobody has to write the specs to it, <clears throat> have a built-in telemedicine, again as Dr. Venki, uh, no, sorry, Dr. Ramki very clearly pointed out, for the last 15 years telemedicine has been used, but somehow it's not having the impact, right? We don't see it making any difference. So we went back and we researched for the last 15 years what has happened, why is that there is no difference? We saw that the telemedicines are being implemented in, in, in bits and pieces in the sense sometimes the technology is right the social engineering is wrong. Sometimes the technology is wrong, sometimes, uh, the, but the social engineering is right. And the whole mix and match of all of these. Sometimes the right kind of stakeholders are not there. Sometimes there is an issue with the, uh, with the people over there. For example, when we rolled this out, we thought we were rolling it out in a place where there are no doctors. Guess what? There may be no doctors, but there are healthcare providers sitting there. And they are not necessarily medically trained health, health uh, providers. They are what we normally call as quacks, but they play a very important role. When we and the, and the government has not been able to provide health care, they were the people who stepped in and provided health care. When you put this kind of a system in place, they get displaced and they went around saying, if you step into this center, your kidneys will be stolen. That's the kind of, of resistance and pushback that you get. And that's just one small example of what we went through to get this done. So um, we made sure that it's not just doctors and patients looking at each other over uh, telemedicine and magically the doctor can find out what's wrong with the patient. We integrated the medical um, diagnostic equipment with the cloud so that there is no human intervention in, in between, so that in a place where there are no uh, skills, or very, very low skills, people can still use this equipment. The, the entire set of medical devices get connected to the health uh, cloud so that the moment a, a drop of blood is put into the system, the analysis is done and sent back to the cloud without any human intervention. I'll just move quickly for the sake of time. I think you've got a, a good idea of what the solution is. There are more details to it. 
uh, one important part is the dashboard that you see in the left, where real time you can see which patient is coming in, what's the profile, who are, how many people have got skin disorders, eye disorders, flu, and so on and so forth. What's the profile of the gender? Is it male, female, their age group, and so on and so forth. All of that you get real time. Every single patient coming in, this gets updated. You can see all these data analytics coming in. So this was what we call the e-health center engineering team because there was social engineering involved. Uh, there was obviously technological engineering involved. And there was a, a mass psychology engineering involved. We went to the temples and we uh, talked about what's going on. We had um, the, um, the village head involved, the, the Sarpanch involved. And it turned out the Sarpanch was not the Sarpanch. And the day we launched it, it turned out he was a wife of the Sarpanch. He was a husband of the Sarpanch. The wife was a real Sarpanch. So those are uh, complexities that keep coming up, surprises that keep coming up. As of now, uh, which is um, July of 2013, this was launched in November last year, so in about uh, eight months. We have treated 15,000 patients in about three different centers. So about 12,000 in Chasala, about two, 3,000 in um, Lakhimpur, about 1,000, 2,000 in uh, Ailabad, outskirts of Hyderabad. These were all the partners who were involved, and I don't think we would have been able to pull this off without these partners in place. And I would thank all the partners. We are planning to replicate it further, and um, the government has put in a fund of $10 million, about 50 crores, in the 12th five-year plan to replicate this and take it forward. And um, as uh, uh, you would have noticed, this uh, project got an award at E-India last evening. It has also got multiple other awards internationally. Uh, these are the people involved. A quick glimpse of uh, all the people who are involved, including CSIR from Government of India. So thank you so much for your patient listening. And there are some links where you can get more details. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. I think we'll uh, take uh, all questions in the end. Um, so we will have uh, now, um, doc doctor. No. Okay. Uh, now we have Muninder uh, Muninder Superna, CIO of uh, Dr. Lalpath Lab. Next speaker. Excuse me. Can someone help me out? Good morning, audience. I am Munendra from Dr. Lal Path Lab, and I am representing Dr. Lal Path Lab. And though I am coming from the healthcare industry, or maybe precisely diagnostic lab, and uh, just a minute. This is my agenda. First thing I would like to uh, explain about what is Dr. Lal Path Lab as a whole. Then my agenda topic is IT at LPL and way ahead and uh, what challenges I am facing uh, as far as industry best practices are concerned. This is Dr. Lal Path Lab. It is Asia's largest lab, 60 years of lab. And uh, we are running with 150 or labs with uh, 2,000 collection centers all across India. Uh, in a year, we are serving with 10 million customers with 30 million samples as a load of our uh, patient samples. We have a largest menu of India, that is 3,000 different tests and panels with 25 specialized departments. And this is our picture of our uh, national reference lab. IT at L. LPL. Categorically, I have divided IP, uh, IT in LPL majorly in three verticals. One is business, second is lab processes, third is technology. In business arena, we have implemented automated billing system, complete end-to-end -end business flow of ERP. We have a KPIs and dashboard to measure our targets and achievements with the different parameters. We have implemented document management system because as far as our SOPs are concerned we have to maintain the prescription of each and every patient and this is very well in place. We have a patient portal and during, uh, through this particular portal we have uh, implemented an e-commerce facility to online registration, scheduling and payment gateway is already integrated with that particular tool. <coughs> report uploading and viewing you can say as a patient you can download your report through our portal. And test profile and information is one of the features of that particular thing. 
We have also implemented loyalty program and it is very well interconnected with all across the application throughout the network. Though mobility is a buzzword in the market and uh, we have already, already implemented one of the mobile device for our home collection executives and they go to your doorstep and collect that particular samples and register your data on the fly and that data automatically goes to our central repository. Second vertical is under L uh, IT is laboratory processes. Yesterday we got an award for this uh, star limbs and this is the new limbs which we have implemented in February 2013 and this is a company named Star Limbs USA and the product itself is named as Star Limbs. It is a web-based application, user-friendly, integration is seamless as far as our business workflows are concerned, that is a silent feature of our limbs. Standardized and automated business processes all across the lab, this is one of the feature. Scalable and in line with our business roadmap because we have, we have a huge user base or you can say it's a huge patient base, we have to consider that particular scalability as far as our growth are concerned. And easy to interface with our third party instruments and third party applications. Uh, during, uh, with this uh, star limbs, there is a capability to run our business on a primary and secondary barcode. This is one of the kind in our industry uh, to run our patient data over the primary and secondary barcode. We have implemented this successfully. Real-time sample tracking to facilitate our patient in a proactive way. We have a largest menu of instrument, that is 250 instruments interface online with our star limbs, or you can say. And third-party interface, it is one of the uh, fe good feature which we have integrated with our star limbs. It is seamlessly integrated with our other limbs like ERP, DMS, and, all, and other clinical tools. We have created a one uh, middleware that is called ESB, Enterprise Service Bus, for that particular integration. And through this bus, we can integrate our third party uh, applications like different HIS and LIS. I will explain you why we have created this type of uh, middleware. Third vertical under IT is technology. We have achieved the 100% virtualization and collaboration under the data center. Tier 3 data center is already implemented and installed in 2010, uh, 2010 in Rohini, New Delhi. We have a successfully disaster recovery side and business continuity plan at IBM data center. And a high availability environment because we are committed to give that particular report to each and every patient in a timely manner. We have made our systems and processes in under a HA mode, high availability mode. Under this, we have a our personal uh, private cloud for each and every location, 150 odd locations. We have applications and database server which is already in HA mode. We have Wi-Fi enabled laboratories and offices. As far as, because though we are in a healthcare industry, we have to think on the security piece of the patient data. That is uh, already in place. IT enabled processes in data security arena. DMZ zone is available there, secured mail gateway is one of the uh, feature we have already implemented. Backup, though we have to take a backup and we have uh, tools for PC backups and each and every servers and application on tape, drive and DR, it is already there and online. On the right hand side, this is our application data workflow for each and every application interrelated, integrated with each other. That is more or less complex one, but we are managing that show. The second last is future of LPL, of, or you can say future of laboratory business a way ahead. Though we, have, we are very much ahead on the technology piece, but still we are evaluating, still we are struggling with that particular technology piece. What is digital laboratory? As far as definitions are concerned, it is laboratory and business processes to be enabled using digital technology to enhance efficiency and optimize cost. These are the very high level likely to be uh, digital laboratory features in future. One is that dynamic business rule engine. In our industry, we are working with a scheduled reporting. I think you have uh, learned about that particular thing. We have a scheduled reporting. What is that? We have a set of tests which will run on a specific dates. 
But while doing this implementation, we can prepon that particular test because that scheduled test is depends upon the batches of that particular thing. If we touch that particular batch in a proactively manner, then we can run that particular schedule in a two or three days before that particular agreed date. That is a runtime and dynamic rule which we are planning to implement in our application. Mobility again, we are have, uh, we have a good roadmap on mobility piece. RFID, it is a future of uh, tracking system because logistics is our, is our backbone for that particular samples because we have a largest uh, load of that particular patient. We, have, we are working with uh, 25,000 patients per day. And RFID is a future to maintain or to logistically handle that particular load because every third year our load is doubled because we are growing with 30% year on year. UID is a uh, future and maybe a game changer in future because we have to identify the exact patient of that particular thing. Trend reporting, yes, it is there. Robotic technology, because th though we have a largest or you can say huge load, we are working on automation of sorting and distribution in a good way. Telepathology is a game changer in future because we have a very niche market as far as part-time doctors and uh, pathologists are concerned. We are planning for uh, roll it out in our network. Personalized customer, customer services. The day will come when patient will ask about the personalized services, maybe routed through SMS, email, email education, knowledge base, and we are also targeting this, this thing in future. Focused marketing. If uh, if a patient is diabetic, he don't require anything on the cardio or something other disease. He may require something on education or knowledge base on that diabetic only. We are also targeting this type of knowledge base and SMS blasting over their mobile. And social media is a future for that particular thing. It is all high level features under digital laboratory. Challenges, sorry. Though we have uh, different challenges as far as our personal and professional life, but categorically I have divided these challenges into two phases, two parts. One is the internal ch challenges within the LPL and external challenges which we may require uh, from the, throughout the peer group and the industry leaders. Uh, we have, yesterday we have got an award for our, one of the star limbs implementation, limbs implementation that is called star limbs. In 2011 we have a, to, uh, implement, we have started this particular project and IT governance is one of my challenge how to maintain, how to manage this type of project which is so huge and the scale is very high. Under this, uh, for that particular thing we have implemented one PMO layer that is program management office and we outsource these services to third party you can say it's IBM and the PMO role is not it is committed to deliver the committed dates and timelines and committed tasks and the, both the project managers of both the companies like Starlims and LPL project manager report to PMO and the complete hierarchy is this PMO reports to steering committee and steering committee reports to executive sponsor. Right top corner you will see that IT governance of that particular project. The scale of the project is so high and uh, this type of projects we usually work always on the, the functional requirement. Every person, every key user will come with you and start discussing on their functional domain. But no one is um, more bo bothered about that non-functional requirement and system load and performance is one of them. Being as a stakeholder of that particular project, we made a consortium between tri-party uh, tri -party parties like Microsoft, Starlims, and LPL. And these parties run multi-rounds of performance tuning and uh, on the application front and on the database front. And uh, we achieve that user expectation as far as loads and performance are concerned. Though we have a heterogeneous environment as far as applications are concerned, that is one of the challenge which we may face during that particular implementation. Apart from these challenges, we have a largest user base. See left, uh, right side, bottom. We, this is one of the challenge, major challenge which any large scale type of project may face. We have a 70 users during UAT, user acceptance test. 
Apart this, because these are the milestones of the project, user acceptance stands, key user training and end user. And we have, we had a 150 users during key user training. And you, you can see it is 650 users which we have to educate them on that particular change. This is one of the challenge, how to manage, how to give and educate them on that particular change. Because change is always a painful event and no one wants to change and no one wants to uh, take adoption of that particular change. But successfully we have achieved this. Last but not the least, this is the external challenges which we may face in future, um, in the past and maybe in future also. That is the integration with different LIS and MI, uh, HIS. Though we, are, we have started one of the vertical called m and Merchant and Acquisition, and during that particular vertical, we have to encounter, encounter different LIS and different players in hospital-based labs. And this is one of the challenge, and I would like to uh, discuss with my peer groups and industry leaders how to cope up that particular change, because they, this is the absenteeism between the uh, industry. There is no data information exchange standard across the, uh, across the industry. We have uh, options of EMRs also. We have uh, n number of options in uh, market, but no EMR talked about with each other. There is a gap in between the EMRs. And uh, as for the Bhattacharya's uh, presentation, it is very well that they are uh, doing some, something in the remotely, but uh, as far as LPLs are concerned, we are facing that particular uh, uh, network infrastructure availability in tier 2 and tier 3 types of how, to you, how you got it that I, uh, we will discuss in offline. That is one of the largest challenge which we are facing uh, as far as our geo presence and penetrations are concerned. This is the last presentation. Thanks a lot. This is my thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have a next speaker, Girish Kulkarni from Atharvan. Atharvan? Huh? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, sorry. That is Magic uh, Tech Solutions. Yeah. Hyderabad. Lived here for a couple of years. I did my master's here in Hyderabad. I was listening to the speech yesterday by the Honorable Minister for IT Government of Andhra Pradesh. He said, uh, H is Hyderabad, B is Biryani. For me, B is Biryani, but H is Halim. And uh, I think the right time to be in Hyderabad because this is Halim's time. Well, that's on the right note, but uh, going ahead, I'm going to be talking about uh, IT in health, the way ahead. We're talking about moving to version 3.0. What's 3.0 all about? Uh, taking it forward from the, the elite uh, panel we had yesterday evening, uh, Dr. Sood was there, uh, Anand Padnaban was there, uh, Dr. Sai was there. Version 1.0 is what probably was there before 2005, and that was the age of digitizing data. Version 2 is what we've been seeing for the last six to eight years. And version 2 was all about continuous care. Today, we are at a situation where we are going forward from version 2.0 to 3.0. And what is 3.0 all about? I'm going to be talking about it in two parts. The first part is going to be pretty generic. This journey to 3.0 primarily encompasses a lot of activity which needs to be done by the provider. We're talking of optimization, optimizing resources, innovation. How do we change things for better? How do we make things work better? Controls, absolutely essential. On one side, you're supposed to be delivering a lot more to your patient. On the other side, you have your payers who are breathing down your neck. Boss, bring down your costs. Right? You're under pressure, so you're not, you, you need to put in controls to make sure you're profitable. And lastly, you've got to manage your entire business more efficiently, and all this would lead to better outcomes. Very big phrase, outcomes. What do we mean by outcomes, or what do I perceive these outcomes to be. 
Well, this is something which I see every day, and this is absolutely fascinating for me. You put up your infrastructure, your integration framework, and then comes this pyramid. We're talking of basic applications, your EMRs, image management, records, forms, formats, and moving up to personalized healthcare. delivering clinical and operational outcomes version 1.0 of healthcare IT was about this it became better in 2.0 but then 3.0 is about collaborating moving from illness to wellness moving from preventive care to predictive care and that's all about moving to 3.0 how do we do it building IT services today it's, it's no more the architect's job it's no more the contractor it's no more your facilities department who are going to be doing it it's all about you a strong and a robust medical grade network smarter and greener buildings the amount of efficiencies you can bring in with your facility equipment air cons, chillers, UPS systems, they're all intelligent today. Integrate them, manage them better, reduce on your operational expenses, put in access control, put in uh, things, put in uh, infrastructure which is going to make things better for the people who work with you. Bring in things like pneumatic tubes, which are becoming very, very common today. And end of the day, it's all about bringing this into a common command console. All your devices today are IP protocol enabled. If I can sit in one place and manage my compute infrastructure globally, why cannot I manage all my other infrastructure? It's not about just the infrastructure today, the patients hardwired to all sort of uh, equipment in the ICUs and in, in the wards and everywhere. Bring this to the patient. Today, sitting on a single command console, I can manage my patient's remote. And that, that's what Dr. Sai spoke about yesterday. Make it possible. It is happening. On the delivery layer, you must have the IT infrastructure, which is green, which is intelligent. I mean, all these are to be done. It has to be there. You don't have a choice today if you have to be competitive. Integrated HIS, integrated building management systems, payer integration. Yes, you have to be there. You have to do it. You don't have a choice. Services, mobility, again a very large thing, but then today, Mobility is predominantly reduced to, you know, typically the doctors majorly using it for posting on Facebook, their emails, and things like that. How much of this is actually being used for patient care? Very limited. Email and SMS gateway. Everybody does it. Everybody have been doing it for years. But how can I make it? more predictive let's say it has to be context based if I can send out an SMS saying that the patient had 100 degrees fever it's very different for two different patients patient one being in, in a normal room the care plan for him is different but the same 100 degree fever for somebody in the ICU needs a very different care plan so how do I make it context-driven SMS, context-driven email integration, which is going to help my clinicians at the point of care to take better decisions? Now, this is being predictive about it. Patient self-services. We spoke about mobility today. Patient keeps downloading. He says, I want my this report. I want the lab report. I want to have my patient advice downloaded onto my smartphone. 
go a step forward, extend it. Look at him using the same app from the time he's discharged from your facility. Give him things which are so simple that every time he takes his diabetic medication, he just goes, enables the radio button and pop, it hits your server, it hits your database and the records are getting updated. So which means today you're talking of self-services which are bi-directional and not just unidirectional. Extend patient care for episode of care. Today, um, the patient life cycle is no longer restricted from the time the patient comes into the facility till the time he's discharged. You are able to monitor the patient from the time you have the ambulance which has picked him up. He arrives at your emergency room where the treating doctors are already aware of his clinical condition. So there is a level one care plan which has already been prepared for the patient. You are ready to welcome him. That's on one side. On the other side, the moment he is discharged from the facility, extend it beyond that. Go to his home. Be there where he needs you. Gone are those days where he would come to you. You need to be there because your patient is there. So that is what I mean by episode of care which is end to end and you manage them. Automate the non-core processes because the non-core processes are important uh, and, and that's where I see that most of the hospitals lose a lot of money. You don't manage your linen properly. Your housekeeping and support staff are not trained properly. They don't use systems and processes. FNB, clinical nutrition is very, very important. But how much of you have put emphasis on building a solid, robust system to handle that data as a part of your integrated HIS? Very limited, right? MIS and dashboards, everybody does it. What's the big deal there? Okay. The, the deal here is, Today, if you go to a stock portal and you want to trade there online, not only do you get the dashboard, but it also tells you the three most important things what you should probably be doing. If I can give the dashboard to the clinician and also tell him, look, this is how the trends are. This is how the pattern is, and this could probably be the problem with your patient make sense to him. Decisions at the point of care become faster. Right? That is a meaningful dashboard. NABH and JCI compliance today, most of the part is done on Excel, run macros, beat. but then you have put in a lot of money on your system. Capture data from the system and make it available on the fly. I don't need a 30-member team in the hospital today just managing my NABH compliance. What a waste of money. Right? Online approval processes and meaningful use of this dashboard is most important. Last part, which is something which is again pretty close to my heart and I keep talking about it, is the ABC analysis. Right? What do I mean by ABC analysis? It's activity-based costing. Take an example where you have costed your procedure at 2 lakhs including the OT. You had said that I'm going to need two doctors and two anesthetists and a set of four nurses to execute that particular procedure. But then, hey, there was an emergency and you had to call in two more doctors and three more nurses. Well, did you cost for it? You have not. So which means on every single transaction, you really don't know whether you are making money or you're not making money. Get down to the granular level. Get your costing in place. You may not charge your patient, but at least I, as somebody who is running the hospital, know very clearly 
whether I made money, I did not make money. If I made money, was it 3%, was it 20%? I don't know. So these are very, very important things going forward because, as I said, you are under pressure on your costing. And sorry. And, and this primarily, you know, uh, keeps showing you the gap on the pyramid as to where you need to be. Integration, SIMS, MIMS, codification, ICD-10. SIMS, MIMS integration is pretty simple, but then it gives all that power at point of care to take decisions. Make it happen, right? Smart rooms, integrate your medical equipment, take the patient data back to his vault. Let the patient have ownership of his data and not the hospital, not the provider. And we live in an ecosystem where uh, today I, I go to Max and tomorrow I go to Fortis and then day after tomorrow I go to a, a local nursing home. But then I have three medical records created, three unique identifiers created in every hospital. And then every time, I lug two files to tell my next doctor what's my clinical status. But then it's a very simple to move it to a vault where I own and I access my data irrespective of whoever doctor, whichever hospital I'm going to. Right? BI and analytics, clinical decision support systems. Surveillance and registers, analytics, your sales and marketing support. Today, I've seen a lot of hospitals who've put in the best of systems, but end of the day, they have a CRM running outside the ecosystem. Big deal. What's it all about? Bring it in, interconnect, give them the power. You're running a uh, you know, you're doing a camp outside the hospital. Give them data upfront on what is the uh, demographic details of, of this uh, set of people whom you are going to be addressing. Go equipped to your patient. Don't go there and be in for surprises. Patient relationship management, very important. Though it was not done, we should be doing it today. I'm a borderline diabetic, so the first question the doctor asked me, was your dad a diabetic? Mom? Anybody else in the family? Let's put in that mechanism today where the family tree and the hierarchy gets interconnected. So that tomorrow we have a better and a predictive model to say my clinical condition was an outcome of this, this, this. Can you close that? Right. Yep. Benefits, efficiencies, outcomes, customer experience, asset utilization, reduced losses, low energy costs, improved TCOs. This may not be the standard mantra for every provider, but then depends on how broad and how deep do you want to automate based on which you have your ROIs and TCO. That's the pyramid. We're back there. And if you need to achieve outcomes, probably these are the steps we should be taking to do that. Quickly on part two, it's, it's about the product I'm associated with, which we've been building as uh, the version three product uh, called the Magic Care. The architecture, including vault integration, everything is available there. We could demo it on the fly anytime. A very strong and a robust activity-based costing model available. BI reports inbuilt, inbuilt BI. You don't have to go outside the platform. It's all there in one single piece of software. Right from budgeting to your P&L. We could discuss more on this, but then I need to make way for my last colleague, so I'll take questions on after this, and I'm available throughout the day to handle questions.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Girish Kulkarni. Uh, he uh, forgot to mention practice aid healthcare in uh, magic technology solutions. Tech solutions. I'm actually an IT doctor. Yep. So, thank you. Uh, uh, we will uh, see, I encourage our audience to, members of the audience to interact with him. Because very importantly, I feel guilty about part two. Where, okay. uh, I only had three slides on part two. Uh, but uh, the point is, time's ahead. Maybe you'll try and see whether there is an opportunity even the interaction session to highlight some of those points. So we have a uh, next speaker, Dr. Murad, B.K. Murali. Uh, of Dr. M. Uh, uh, this is uh, Hope Softwares. He's going to be a final speaker of the session. Good morning. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Murli, an orthopedic surgeon, owner of Hope Hospitals. Uh, I'll be talking to you about uh, the advances in healthcare. Uh, I'd like to show you a few videos, uh, very short ones. My mother was being treated for malaria. After 10 days of hospitalization and no signs of improvement, a doctor told me that my mother had acquired an infection of the urinary tract. I was shocked, angry, and scared. She was now being treated for a disease that she did not have when she was admitted into the hospital. They also told me that such infections are resistant to regular antibiotics. My mother died of a hospital acquired infection of the urinary tract. Okay. Uh, there are 25 major industries, and all 25 major industries seamless, shamelessly copy ICT from the other industries to improve their services but except one the healthcare industry four years back I developed DRM Hope being a hospital owner and an orthopedic surgeon in Nagpur which is the medical hub of central India I was confronted with a lack of complete hospital management system uh, lack of uh, electronic medical record system that I could access from anywhere, from any time, uh, from, from my hospital. I was confronted with a lack of proper tracking system to reduce errors. I was challenged to create a solution to the many issues and challenges faced by my hospital. Remember, Nagpur caters to about uh, one million population. Now, what is DRM Hope? Now, DRM Hope is an enterprise level uh, SaaS based hospital information system. It is an open source, trusted technology. It integrates different information systems uh, into a one single efficient system. It can be accessed from anywhere, anytime, from any web-enabled device. It solves the problem inherent in hospitals in a net where there is a network of multiple programs that are not compatible. It, it can integrate almost any type of services, systems, departments, processes, data, can even handle non-medical services and functions like security, maintenance, etc. And of course, it reduces medical errors and improves quality of care, like you see in this story. <coughs> I and my team went from hospital to hospital to see how hospital-acquired infections were monitored. We visited 1,200-bedded uh, uh, private uh, teaching hospital. The number of deaths happening in this hospital due to HAI was very high. They didn't have tools to analyze data. And if they did analyze, they did nothing. Uh, they were in a phase of analysis paralysis. Other challenges uh, were uh, purchasing, running, maintaining large IT infrastructure and resources. 
and intercommunication is difficult, poor internet connectivity and obsolescence of an existing software. Here DRM Hope made the difference. What we had for them was a unique innovative solution to solve the basic healthcare needs of a cost, at a cost competitive way in India that we can roll out to other parts of the world as well. <clears throat> there were the, uh, these pain areas that we identified, low bandwidth, low internet, equipment integration, our painkiller was offline mode which sinks later. Now here I'll show you uh, how um, HII could be prevented, uh, hospital acquired infections. The EMR, uh, we start from the, the microbiology lab where the, uh, we find out where, from where the trend is, from the OT, ICU, ward and trace it to the healthcare worker on duty, take preventive corrective action and do the root cause analysis. <laughs> So what is the immediate compelling need? Like uh, we have been discussing last two days, uh, uh, Ministry of Health has introduced a uniform system of uh, maintenance of uh, electronic medical records by the hospitals. Um, that is definitely an uh, immediate compelling need. Uh, then there, are, there is NABH, out of 25,000 hospitals, maybe only about say 300 hospitals are accredited which means that only 1% 1 of the hospitals in India comply with um, the government norms to prevent HII. The hospitals simply don't have the tools or technology as they are not affordable. Uh, the Indian government enacted uh, the Clinical Establishment Act, made it compulsory for hospitals to comply with certain basic quality norms. Without these, hospitals cannot get business from um, ex-servicemen's organizations, CGHS, etc. The bottom line is, but if they don't comply, they perish. And in India, we, caught, uh, we collect a lot of data, but this data is irrelevant if it is not analyzed. The tool is also necessary for any hospital thinking of medical tourism. As a, without NABH, uh, they do not qualify. In the US market, uh, there's an uh, enforcement of uh, meaningful use incentive. So it's made it a requirement for the healthcare industry to maintain a patient electronic medical records, offering practitioners a payment for, uh, from the federal government to apply this in their day-to-day -day activity for improving the quality of patient care. Uh, we have uh, re we've commercialized, we are fully, uh, we have been uh, piloting it for, uh, for the last three years. Now it's been working very well in various hospitals. Various hardware uh, compatibility uh, is possible. Various hospitals have used it. So here, um, DRM Ho, the hospitals just plug in and subscribe to the services on a per transaction basis. It's built on shared infrastructure and resources and you pay as much as you use. Offline mode, there's no capex involved, it reduces the cost per transaction to about one tenth of the cost of a legacy software and it provides a EMR, telemed telemedicine platform, integrated wallet card technology, PC kiosk based and mobile based technology. So this is the difference uh, between a SaaS model where you pay as much as you use model and a pay upfront model. So it's like uh, renting a house. You uh, subscribe to the service on a per transaction basis. There's no capex involved. Whereas when you buy a legacy software, there's an exorbitant capex involved. There is no infrastructure. There's no, uh, you don't need all these uh, servers uh, in your hospital. You don't need an army of software professionals. So you reduce time. Uh, there's no installing, deploying, maintaining servers, upgrades, and versions are released by the providers. So 
So this is how uh, 2010 we started this journey uh, and today we are uh, targeting 1000 bedded hospitals both in India and abroad. It's various awards that you have won. So we provide value additions to the patient's hospital experience, bringing the wow factor by providing uh, these uh, 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 wow factors that I call, uh, ge generating of unique uh, privilege card, the QR code for each patient, retrieving hospital reports and uh, discharge summaries by logging onto the hospital website, voice message reminders, online self-scheduling of appointments, then you have Pizza Hut module for caller identification at the front office. <coughs> Where is innovation, smart rooms, language interpreters, support portal, the dashboard which is integrated in, in the application. We, we are the winner of the India Innovation Growth Program the last year and this year's E-India Awards and uh, the best innovation in healthcare IT uh, in the Healthcare Expansion India Summit. Our business and technology partners uh, are globally a uh, FIKI, Stanford Business uh, Graduate School and uh, IC Square Lockheed Martin. We are HIPAA compliant, HL7 compliant. So we reduce cost, we reduce time, improve uh, the quality and maybe help reduce the deaths because of medical errors in hospitals. SaaS uh, represents one of the highest levels of technological advancement in the evolution of healthcare industry, but a mindset shift is required. Reach for the cloud now, change before you have to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murli. Um, I think all in all, you will all agree that uh, between the four speakers, um, the situation is very, that in very aptly tightly, the way ahead. You heard uh, Dr. Bhattacharya talk about uh, um, telemedicine, uh, container-based telemedicine, and especially espousing leveraging on uh, the cloud model in a big way. And uh, you heard uh, the next speaker, Lalpath Lab, uh, very large uh, diagnostic lab, um, all the way um, incorporating state-of-art uh, IT in there. Um, as a CIO, he spoke about uh, um, all the latest features how they have done in um, the digital all the way up to digital lab, concluding with one or two topic issues relating to challenges uh, making it uh, um, still left job for them to complete. And then we heard uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Girish Kulkarni talk about illness to wellness. Um, they very passionately speak about the current journey of uh, IT in healthcare, the new generation of uh, HAS product and concluding uh, with uh, Dr. Murli talking about uh, um, uh, fresh from the oven last three years going from places to places about uh, SaaS based, uh, SaaS model based uh, um, uh, a product with uh, the best you can think of. So all put together I think you have a very good uh, um, in the menu on the table. Now I open it to the, I invite the audience to ask them what is the road ahead if you have such a wonderful products and wonderful case studies. 
what are your plans to take them forward and uh, how much it inspires uh, each one of you or you have any questions and doubts please go ahead and ask your share of questions yeah would you mind uh, each one of you introducing so i might know some of you uh, having met some of you for the benefit of the audience on the road ahead for IT and uh, getting your viewpoint on that field. So I have a question, one is Janal and uh, there are two, three, two the specific speakers. Firstly, the genetic questions, like most of you have brought out that there's a need for providing some kind of uh, leadership in terms of policy formulation or incentivization uh, by the Ministry of Health or the other directorates to accelerate the process of IT adoption in healthcare. Uh, wherever yesterday we heard from the IT leaders and ministers that there's slew of initiatives and incentives in terms of tax debates that have been offered to IT as such. But when it comes to its adoption in healthcare sector, so what more uh, uh, kind of incentives uh, can you spell out in terms uh, of uh, specifically for healthcare uh, IT and from uh, healthcare uh, ministry or the directorate DDHS uh, will further promote the adoption of or encourage its uh, 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 widespread uh, use in healthcare. So that's the first uh, question. Then second is pertaining to Mr. Jajit Bhattacharya about the e-center, cloud-enabled e-center uh, telehealth services. So there you mentioned you're using a satellite-based uh, uh, services and I understand that is ISRO leads satellite. So our experience with this uh, satellite is that it's very erratic and the service is not uh, assured, reliable. So how has been your experience and do you have one container in your system as of now and future plans though you mentioned you are planning to scale it up. And for Dr. Murli, I have a question that you mentioned about your SaaS-enabled uh, hospital management information system and software. How exactly does it help and what module of that will help you in prevention of hospital-acquired infections, like the example of urinary tract infection you gave? So how exactly is it going to help in that area? Is it tracking the infection or some kind of alerts? Or so if you could throw some more light on that. Thank you. I'm going to test uh, the memory of the audience and the panelists because panelists anyway they will have a distributed load they will remember at least their portion of the question so I'm going to take two more questions and then let the answers flow in two more questions please yeah uh, there are two questions on the left side of the lady there and then the back end lady first Hi, uh, my question is to Head. Where do you locate the role of NGOs in the uptake of ICTs in health? That's kind of my question. Anyone of you understand the question? Okay, would you... The role of NGOs in the uptake oh, of yeah, ICTs. Good question. Very good question. Yeah. yeah, second question. Third, uh, last. After that, we will uh, get the answer. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Manish. Uh, I represent Mazik Global. We also are into HIA Serena. Like we have a product which is called uh, Mazik Care. So my question is to uh, Mr. Murli, uh, wherein I want to know, like because I have been approaching to many hospitals, around 400 hospitals I have visited uh, through call and direct visit and all. So the question is like still I found the maturity in the acceptance of IT is not there. That is the first thing. Second thing like still the pro, uh, the IT enabling which you are talking is still considered as a billing system. It is not considered like other automation like your finance and other things. So my question to you is like how much you are feeling, do you have the same feeling that IT is still not mature in healthcare? It is still going to take some more time or it is mature enough to accept this kind of uh, concept and other stuff? Okay. Now I'm going to again go from the left to right because you're having a maximum question. So I'm going to test your memory maximum. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll So I'll answer two of the questions which I thought was directed to me. One was on connectivity. I think that's a 
excellent question and that's a question even you had while we were sitting here. Um, we had taken some cinematic uh, privileges in putting satellites over there. Um, it is being used but as you rightly pointed out if there is a cloud cover attenuation happens and so on and so forth cost becomes quite high and specifically if you look at the rollouts happening in Afghanistan the cost goes to about $2,000 per month which is not sustainable. Uh, when you're talking about affordable health care it's, it's oxymoronic to say we'll have uh, 1 lakh rupees per month as connectivity cost. What we are doing is a mix and match of everything. Uh, so we are co-locating each of these e-health centers next to a mobile phone tower. Now the mobile phone towers are quite pervasive. They are there where there are no hospitals and if fiber optic is getting into the mobile phone tower. From there if you saw in the video there is an antenna which goes up and there is a wireless connectivity to the mobile phone tower. Also there is an ethernet connectivity coming in. In other places in northeast where we are rolling out we are also working on algorithms to optimize some of the data and some of the process changes that we are doing so that satellite can effectively be used because we need to have the doctor real time. It cannot be an offline kind of a mechanism. So that's basically how we are taking care of connectivity. It's a mix of process innovation and also technological innovations. Uh, in terms of the question that the lady there asked about NGO, if you saw the last slide, there are a whole bunch of partners. NGOs play a very critical role because we just cannot, and I repeat, cannot roll out in the rural areas without the help of appropriate NGOs. Again, the word appropriate is quite important because many NGOs will have a part understanding of the situation. I would also call the, the Sarpanj as one of the NGOs. You need to have multiple NGOs because there is so much of dynamics going on that it's impossible to roll things out without a bunch of NGOs being involved and one NGO being a lead NGO who understands what is going on in that particular place. So absolutely critical role. In our case, it was in the first rollout, it was OP, Jindal, Sanstan. In Hyderabad, it's a body called um, Share India, which is an NGO, and so on and so forth. No, I don't have any questions. Okay, no, no, no. can still take the... Uh, I'm, I agree with Bhattacharya about the NGO. Yes, uh, NGO will create a leading load, uh, role in that particular rolling out of any ICT or any health care, or you can say any CSR type of job. I also want you to take the last person's question about he had a, some kind of a cynicism about that question. That can you come again with the question because <laughs> I oh, didn't. No, no, no. You're only a diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. Huh? I don't no, think so. Last What's the question, question was, was about 200 bedded hospital and uh, they are uh, not uh, easily motivatable and things of that kind. Uh, See, across states, some are leaders, some are laggards. So laggard states have to be motivated. And give them a lot of incentive why they should adopt IT. Similarly, leader states are all very well off. So, for instance, whenever we travel, we always see in Tamil Nadu, they made it a repetitive gazette notification, make it mandatory for doctors and health workers. No data entry operators. You only have to do it directly. So, people fell in line. Two years, they fell in line. Whereas, you go to north, they say, never. We will never do data entry because there are 150 patients are outside my room. OPD, no hope at all. So, it's a thing of st carrots and sticks is an absolute must. I think the same thing will apply in the case of uh, private sector. I'm sure if the hospital administration sees some value, they'll find a method of getting it. So, it's the way I see a private sector is concerned. Government uses clinical establishment and otherwise some amount of regulatory appropriate time good time, they do so, so they have to do so, and in turn hospital incentivizes as well as makes it to the doctors and health workers. So both these uh, issues will have to be done. So I think if we have to do the so-called synchronized swimming and time bound, something has to happen, this combination is a must because without that people do not uh, fall in line. I'll uh, quickly take uh Dr. Sood's question on uh, the network connectivity and I agree with uh, Dr. Bhattacharya as that you need to have a combination of whatever is the best possible infrastructure which is available. Reliance card, data card, chale na chale gaon mein, but uska voice toh bilkul chale ga hi chale ga. Right? So that's the logic. You have to drive it that way. But then uh, VSATs again are probably the best option to reach out to the rural uh, community. And I would say that because uh, it's, it's robust and it's always connected. Yes, it needs a little more application from the service provider side. He needs to probably put in a, uh, an outdoor unit which is pumping in more power. For him, 
more power on the ODU means a larger of the frequency on the transponder which is being used. He would not have costed for it, so he doesn't provide you for that. He says, this is what is standard, so please take it. Connect hota hai, nahi hota hai, mara problem nahi hai. But then if you can get your service provider to work, understand the problem, it's, it's a solvable issue. It doesn't take more than uh, probably uh, an hour across the table to close that. But yes, it is definitely possible. I have implemented uh, large VSAT networks across myself, uh, uh, even uh, at places uh, when, uh, you know, Gammon was building a dam across uh, the Brahmaputra, 35 kilometers from the Chinese border, and there was nothing else available, but then they were connected. So it, it's an application from the VSAT service provider side, which you will have to negotiate and get it. Otherwise, it doesn't come on the platter by default, Doc. Yeah, uh, I'll start with a question, the last question. Uh, the question was adoption of uh, EHR and EMR and uh, hospital and, uh, information systems and hospitals. Uh, it's very true that uh, the adoption of uh, s the technology has been very slow. Uh, that, that was my opening statement, in fact, uh, that all other industries have uh, shamelessly copied this, uh, the ICT uh, from each other industry, but healthcare has never thought of uh, adopting uh, ICT. Um, how do we? Uh, uh, Before that, why is it so? Yeah, why? Yeah, well, why? I'll tell you the very simple reason. Doctors don't want to share their medical data to another doctor. A hospital doesn't want to share their medical data with another hospital. It's very simple. Uh, as long as you hold the patient's uh, data, you, uh, the, you, you're the monopoly. You, the patient has to come back to you. So interoperability has to be enforced. And that is what government is doing. That is what Ministry of uh, Health is doing. It, uh, it has now uh, come up with guidelines for uniform uh, system of uh, maintenance of EHRs. So now, uh, once that is implemented, now how will the Ministry of Health implement it? It has to start with CGHS recognized hospitals. Now, Ministry of Health pays hospitals for treatment of central government employ uh, employees, for the treatment of their employees. It can start with that. It can say that we will pay you only if you have a recognized uh, uh, EHR which has interoperability as one of its features. So that is one thing. Next, um, other government like ECHS, ex-servicemen, uh, or even insurance companies, can, like how NABH uh, Arugashri. Yeah, Arugashri, yeah. So they, um, these are the, uh, <laughs> like how NABH was, uh, was actually enforced because CJHS said that if you are not NABH, uh, we will not send our uh, central government employees for treatment to you. So that is how uh, this will have to be enforced. And uh, like in the US, uh, uh, they have uh, meaningful use. Yeah. <clears throat> And the, another question was uh, about uh, uh, errors, uh, uh, HA, hospital acquired infections and medical errors. So now, uh, we have to emphasize a lot on preventing medical errors, like a s s infection. Now, uh, uh, in a large hospital, there is an ICU, which is a 50 bedded ICU, and there are certain um, uh, infections which are drug resistant. And if your application captures those infection, those microbes in the lab, you can trace it back to the ward, you can trace it back to the beds of where a particular staff was on duty. So you, you should have a, a robust business intelligence uh, integrated inside your application, like how uh, some of uh, my colleagues have been talking about. So if you have that, then you will be able to track the hospital acquired infection right from the lab to the ICU, OT, and find out the cause, whether it is improper, uh, 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 aseptic uh, precautions not being maintained properly, or is it uh, because of not, uh, like hand washing technique not being implemented. So the preventive and corrective action 
uh, can be taken on the basis of the business intelligence that you get from the application. Get any other question? Get unanswered? Okay, go ahead. Could somebody pass the mic to him? Uh, hi, uh, this is Manik and I'm from IBM. Uh, since yesterday I've been, you know, hearing all the presentations, uh, you know, related to big data, data analytics, and Dr. Kulkani today talked about, you know, some of the predictive analysis. So, you know, being, uh, you know, like having worked with a lot of healthcare establishments, you know, in India, uh, as, as a vendor, you know, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, most of the establishments, even though they have a lot of data, you know, which can, you know, we can run trends on, but the basic relevant fields, you know, are not there. Uh, you know, uh, so if I, if I, you know, if I were to go to a client and we, you know, we find out that, you know, it would take at least two years or three years for them to add those, you know, relevant information in their system, you know, to be able to, you know, give some trends or some projections. So, I mean, that's, I think I've heard from a lot of my, you know, BA colleagues, you know, who've been working with various clients. So, w w what do you think about this? How do you think we can be addressed? Uh, I mean, that's what I, I want to know. Yeah, um, understand and agree that uh, a lot of bits and bytes in the data piece is missing. But then as a solution provider, as a vendor, as a partner to a provider, I think the onus comes back to you as an organization to bring in best practices. And I have normally seen, no offense meant, but I have normally seen this happen at the stage of contract but not beyond that. Beyond that, it gets hijacked by the local hospital administration. And you, as a partner, would not be able to foot down and say, I need this. But then, why do you need it? Very relevant. Understand. If I cannot get my data structures properly in place, how am I going to make meaningful outcomes from it to take decisions? And this is something which lies upon you as a provider to impress upon the, you know, the healthcare providers to adapt. So even if it means that some screens need to be modified, some additional fields need to be added, it has to come from you. It's not the other way around. It will never come from the hospital. Right. Yep. That's a useful one. Yeah, uh, you know, on the ground, uh, I kind of empathize with your question in the sense uh, when we go on the ground, and especially government hospitals, they're treating probably 20 patients in a minute, uh, which means, you know, less than a minute, uh, about like a minute or two minutes per patient. Then we're telling them to enter the diagnostics very accurately. Now, again, how you enter and what you enter makes a difference. If you use the ICD codes and you say respiratory disease, what kind of respiratory disease, and it goes, uh, you know, layer by layer, and you keep choosing and, and it keeps opening up. And it may just be the wrong diagnosis. Also, um, uh, the current medical fraternity depends on the fact that there is only one diagnosis that they'll be making per disease and per patient. Again, medical uh, research has itself shown that that's uh, in 80% of the cases not true. You typically have multiple uh, issues where one of them is a primary issue. Now, all of that is not really getting captured. Therefore, what is the value of the system uh, and the data becomes a question mark. Again, because of use of white, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of antibiotics we use, which is white spectrum antibiotics, you'll have one diagnosis, you'll give that. It has solved some of the problem, and what your diagnosis was, was not correct. And so therefore, what enters into the system, again, becomes, in, in a sense, garbage. So what you enter becomes quite a, a challenge, especially in the Indian situation, because do you enter accurately or do you treat people? That becomes a question on the ground. Okay, thank you. He has given a twist. No? Okay. See, I have always seen this business about so-called minimum data set, you do the bare minimum, then uh, doctors say it's not good enough. But if you make it so elaborate, then that is not, so doesn't work. So if you give choice to both, then the interoperability doesn't work. So I think uh, you have to be a little careful in bulldozing your way through after some point. That's it. We'll see after review it after three years, five years. Then we'll see what happens. So that is, I think, uh, this uh, health sector complicates things sometimes more than necessary. I think. Eighty percent of the problems settle down in that incubation period. Exactly. I think the incubation period, as he's saying, eighty percent of the problem will settle down, and people will all agree to reconcile. Certain things are. Uh,
okay okay we'll live with, with it okay there is another question i saw it. oh yes antha padmanabhan i am president of kaveri group of hospitals i must uh, first of all compliment the speakers for their outstanding uh, presentations all the four uh, i have two uh, specific questions um, uh, one is to dr morley you know people here uh, like me are obsessed and addicted towards it in healthcare please understand most of us uh, have been working for a long time it is true that we have not replicated what other industries did and people like us are trying to uh, do the job of uh, canvassing support for it in healthcare but i have a specific question for dr morley uh, people like us have not been using this uh, transaction model you know per transaction model we have not been using uh, we have been owning uh, our infrastructure uh, we employ uh, our own uh, it people but of course we uh, we buy uh, software from outside vendors and that's it we are not uh, outsourcing the entire it uh, facility or transaction model uh, when i own uh, the it uh, infrastructure like servers or computers i claim depreciation and maybe i have a small lean group of uh, it people and i purchase the software from outside so if i work out the per transaction cost suppose if it costs about 100 rupees per transaction um, uh, what will be your cost per transaction that is going to be the deciding factor uh, second factor that is going to decide for, for a person like me maybe i am in charge of four hospitals with about 1000 beds across uh, second question um, that bothers me is about the security of data one is as you rightly said doctors don't want to part with the data but if i am going to be the mischief maker may putting it uh, with some other server and then uh, see uh, and uh, they see this uh, data somewhere in some other hospital i am in trouble that is the question for you uh, the second uh, point that was raised by my friend from ibm a very relevant question uh, i have a comment to make on this uh, because i keep creating masters uh, for all the uh, hospitals whether it is a pharmacy master or a materials master or a disease master we make about 42 to 50 masters we make and how do we capture this master data you know we have a screen to capture that uh, data and when we design that screen believe me in some of the opd modules we won't have the aadhar number right now you ask anybody they won't have provided a field for aadhar number aadhar number is going to be a big thing in the future so uh, i think it is here that the it vendor and the hospitals uh, it uh, guy and maybe the doctors should sit together and focus a lot on masters creation very very important as he rightly said after about five four years if you ask for a data which needs a lot of business intelligence work and if you have not captured data four years ago it is very difficult to call out that information so in my opinion creating that master is of extraordinary importance and i'm sure we will take cognizance of that thank you very much matter of time the economics will settle down it will not be any solution will not be taken up if the transaction cost is a comparative choices like internal servers and things like that the saas model will not take up take off unless uh, um, it is not is prohibitively expensive so how they price it is a different issue um, so all those issues are involved they in turn from buying it from the someone else the, uh, from the cloud provider at what rate they provide and things like that. second is i have been wondering when this issue relating to privacy security in the cloud he meant you, you talked about it you talked about it i think this is a banking and uh, health are two sectors will be more conservative than anybody else in moving on to some of these uh, i don't think they will uh, that move in that easily because the issue itself has not been properly i reassured to be people that these are all a solved problem fully in a cloud so i like to take those questions. regarding the pricing uh, the pricing of the cloud uh, application is priced on a tra per transaction basis but then uh, it is not a standard price for every hospital it uh, if you have uh, roughly i can tell you that if you have uh, thought of uh, uh, per transaction of uh, 100 is the 100 rupees yeah i'm giving you a uh, example if you if you have calculated that it's 100 rupees per transaction for your hospital i am sure a, a saas provider will be giving you uh, uh, his application for 10 rupees per transaction so that is the that is the amount of benefit one tenth will be the cost and uh, the second thing about the privacy see uh, 
when I uh, developed this application four years back, this was an issue. Today it is not an issue. Today it has matured a lot. Uh, uh, the US has adopted it uh, 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 wholeheartedly. Uh, and we have uh, incorporated so many features which uh, a standalone hospital cannot uh, incorporate. There are so many features which uh, the banking sector, we have taken from the banking sector, the credit card type of security that we have incorporated. Uh, today it is no longer an issue. Just want to uh, make sure that we don't uh, sleepwalk in the sense that what he said is absolutely right. Uh, the software is a very, very uh, strong and robust. The issue with privacy is that it's basically personally identifiable information, which means that the owner of the data is the patient. Now it's the capability of the, or the capacity of the patient to ensure that the data stays private uh, in the system. Now the system is robust. The leakage will happen because the patients are not capable enough to manage the data. Essentially they have to share the data with multiple health providers. And if they go to a local doctor, if we, if we assume that there's a utopian solution where there is a centralized cloud where all your data is there and you can go to the doctor and say, here is my keyword, please enter it, now see my data and then analyze what I've got. That's, that's the utopian solution. Now if that happens, I'll go to the local doctor and the local doctor may not be the right doctor and may have a compromise on the data. And those are issues we still need to be uh, bothered about because it's a capacity building issue. Okay. Uh, with this, uh, we will come to the end of this session. It has been definitely uh, uh, sort of, I would say, demonstrated to the speakers and the audience that uh, we have crossed a good distance to take off. Will we take off? Is the question. I think how long can you be a doubting Thomas? Should we or should we not be? I think uh, they say in Silicon Valley the hockey stick approach. After some time, one fine day, it takes off. So similarly, I guess a uh, couple of nudging from the government, from regulatory, from standards, mandation, as well as setting examples, as well as spending some good money, big budgets. So combination of these and competition within the private sector. So many of those things and some um, leaders will come, product vendors will push. I think it's a combination of these once uh, changes, perhaps I have a feeling we would have, um, we'll see the, the days of, the days of um, um, the road ahead will be much brighter than almost uh, for quite some time the days we were waiting for would arrive. Thank you. I would like to thank the panelists and all of you for staying back, uh, spilling your switch spill over time. Panelists for this insight insightful session. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Mr. Srinivasan Ramakrishnan uh, for uh, chairing the session. I would uh, request Dr. Jayjit Bhattacharya to present a memento to Sri Srinivasan Ramakrishnan. A big hand. And then I would request uh, uh, Sri Srinivasan Ramakrishnan to present mementos to all the speakers. Uh, to start with uh, Dr. Jajit Bhattacharya again. Uh, um, Sri Munindar Soparna. A big hand please. Sri Girish Kulkarni. Last but not the least, Sri B.K. Murli. Thanks again to all the speakers and the audience.